Jim Joyce, your hair is getting better every time we talk. <laughs> I'm drawing it out, man. It's called the <laughs> it's called the uh, the plague. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I totally would not be made for like a real live show, especially with a co-host. Like you're running like a minute and a half late and I'm like, holy crap, because our next guest is already waiting in the waiting room. And so, yeah, yeah I just. I thought I was, I thought I was in Germanic line here. I was, I was teed up <laughs> waiting to, <laughs> to, the, to the thing. I'm doing my best, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Yeah. Anyway, well, welcome to Wednesday again. Um, you know, I, n not to ignore the elephant in the room, um, I saw something, uh, obviously there's a lot of, uh, you know, horrendous news around us. Um, I saw something, just to bring a little bit, I, I don't even know how to bring light to the dark situation, but um, I saw somebody post, uh, don't be trash. And the trash stands for T for transphobic, R for racist, A for abusive, S for sexist, H for homophobic. So I think in all of it, don't be trash. We're all human beings and 99.9% .9 of our DNAs are all the same. So yeah, 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 no, it's a, it's a big, it's a big week. It's a big week. It's, I, I was actually looking, I, we say this every week, but this week I was particularly looking forward to the shot of yeah. digital health therapy. Um, yeah, definitely made me, it, it had us rethink everything again. You know, like how many lessons, how many yeah. lessons. Yeah, don't don't be what's it don't be trash i can't even don't be that. trash that's yeah. that's the that's the short version right um so I, I thought i thought that kind of honestly hit home on all of this um yeah but uh let let's uh yeah. let's review our numbers real quick i you know i don't know how many people actually care but i do um that's personally <laughs> so from the beginning, uh, by the way, uh, just uh, you, I think uh, I posted something last week um, that by Sunday evening, uh, well, I listed all of our episodes uh, and whoever got the, you know, the most additional views uh, till Sunday wins a shot glass. We're going to have to improvise as entrepreneurs on what that means, what kind of shot glass. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, Marina actually said, well, maybe the winner is because it's the freshest episode. So the hint here is Francesca got the most increases in views through right. from the day that I posted to Sunday. Yeah. So we're going to have to figure out something there. To She's got a big following. She's got a big following, you know? I guess so. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so we're at uh, almost 90 hours of view time from the beginning. Uh, please, thank you, viewers uh, and listeners. Um, and then... Uh, about 1.8 thousand impressions. Um, I'm gonna hop over to our podcasting section. So right. we're at 170 downloads slash listeners. And I just had a quick session with um, our, our, our main man at Digital Health Today, Dan Kendall, and he gave me a little trick. Spotify makes a copy of the stuff and therefore those numbers never included it. So we actually have another 67 listeners on Spotify alone on top of what I sent before. So wow. that's, a, that's our, yeah. that's our, we're making waves, making waves. We're making Touching waves. I think so. It's the only time. <laughs> so let's not wait. Let's not make our, our guest wait. We just can't stay away from those Americans in Europe. Um, and we'll probably just have her introduced, but I, I love her title on LinkedIn. So uh, this is Sarah Fisher, Entrepreneur Inside. Um, I know she's been with Jane j for many years. Um, I actually found out, I think last summer that she's also a health coach. So curious to get some of that information and I'm gonna let her in. Let's go, let's let her in. Sarah Fisher. Sarah, you're. Yeah, she's connecting. There hey. you are. Hey. What's happening? You, you, you got on the show, Sarah. I know. Can you believe it? Uh, it's it's, it's, it's yeah. awesome. The bar is really high. <laughs> so I, I, I. I pretended that I wasn't, you know, in the top five or anything. That's cool, guys. That's cool. No, hey, there, there's always top 10. Top 10 is what really counts, actually. <laughs> you are super if we got really boring and, and you know, if we were bringing you in, we're holding you in the wings. 
<laughs> Actually, kind of, kind of sucks for uh, for guest number eleven, as we just said. You know, top ten is what really matters. So, so Sarah, I I'm remembering. So, so first of all, we we did like a very short introduction of you, and I just love your title of entrepreneur inside. So, um, what, what do you? What do you mean by that? Inside a big organization or inside your heart? And maybe just give like 30 seconds on you. You're trying to get out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to break out. <laughs> yeah, help is what I mean. Help, anybody help, help me. <laughs> no, I mean, actually I was kind of redoing my LinkedIn profile, which was so out of date, it was embarrassing. And even parts that it still are. I just can't even sometimes even figure out how I need to update pieces. Um, it looks like I've worked at J&J in various jobs for like quitting on and off for about, I don't know, the last 20 years. So it's still wrong. But at least I got a headline that caught your attention. So that's it did. good. It did. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's what it does mean. It's it sort of, it, the entrepreneur inside, I mean, it really came from, um, I've had a very difficult time, honestly, articulating what the heck it is I do for the last 18 years. And even now people are always like, what do you do? And my husband included, what do you do? <laughs> like, well, it's sort of a mixed bag of this and a mixed bag of that. And then somebody called me to do this. And you know, that's yeah. sort of how my life goes. And so then I started figuring out like, who am I? What am I doing? And actually I'm just constantly building new businesses and looking for new opportunities and creating like a net that entrepreneurial spirit inside of a corporation. I'm mostly focused externally. I push myself to network internally. Um, so you know, I have to be honest about kind of where my focus is and what I'm good at. And I think that's actually what I'm good at is inside of a $75 billion corporation trying to kind of push us to innovate and build new businesses that you know actually do become profitable. So, yeah. so I'm gonna like to I'm gonna recommend a book. I don't know if you've heard of it. This is a, a, a newfound buddy of mine, Greg Larkin. He comes from financial industry, um, and I actually read his book. And I think it, it's called the uh, I think the exact title is "What May Get You Fired at Work," and it's like entrepreneur story, uh, which is kind of his story and what it takes. Um, yeah. maybe we'll get him on the show, Jim, one one of these days too. Uh, so shout out, yeah, and he actually 11. just just created this group i just participated uh, yesterday morning it's uh, punks and pinstripes and it's like the intro un entrepreneurs uh, it was like 30 yeah. people on that call it was awesome so yeah, yeah. In intra entrepreneurs actually i yeah. was thinking i was thinking um that so it's kind of it's funny and i was what's happening with you how it, it, there has to be a small group of people that are focused on digital healthcare in europe that are americans that move to europe to kind of yeah. establish offices or build their careers. Like it, it can't be more than like a dozen people. Like, you, you yeah, we probably got them all, right? I mean <laughs> Episode 11, 12. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just remember coming out of my uh, house at the time in Amsterdam on Valer Valeriestraat and yeah. seeing uh, somebody who I think I know just carrying like stairs on a bike or something and it comes sarah <laughs> moving houses or something <laughs> do you remember that yeah <laughs> yeah i like to dive right into the culture of where i live you know just go yeah. all in and so yeah well, everything's by bike so so it's um so you're when did you move so you moved to initially moved to amsterdam or did you move to london first you went to no i did amsterdam in 2012. okay so you moved to amsterdam eight years. yeah and then You've built a career doing, I always thought it was like external innovation. Was that the right title sometime? Yeah. 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 And yeah. I can focus on medical devices or? Yeah. I mean, I started in med tech because I have more of a commercial brain than I do a scientific brain. And for me, like the energy of taking, you know, a hard asset, like a novel technology and trying to figure out how to get somebody to use it, adopt it, pay for it. You know, you're cutting a deal. There's a contract. There's like a, there's money exchange. The commercial right. side of med tech to me was much more challenging and interesting than um, the pharmaceutical side, where I thought actually a lot of the work comes in early market access and uh, in the science, frankly, right? Um, and then the commercial side, you're not, you, it's more PR than it is. I mean, I, I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's a, it, there's, not, there's, no, there's no contract exchange, there's no money deal. And there's not like, it's kind of like, okay, if this is an approved therapy, 
um, and there is a favorable maybe reimbursement status, et cetera, in the U.S., whatever, formulary status, then the commercial effort is you kind of really promoting what it can do and reminding people about its benefit. Um, whereas I think, you know, the stuff I've worked on, which is all sort of software backed or what we now call convergence, which is like drug device combination therapies, which don't fit anywhere. Um, this was like before the FDA even had regulations around software, they were like, you're on your own, you regulate yourself. So I would be calling India for software support, right? Is the, those days. Um, you know, I think that really was like, okay, heavy lifting, like you were sitting in biomed departments in the evening and you had to make sure that nurses were okay with this new soft piece of software technology you were bringing into hospital, completely right. disrupting their workflow. So kind of all the challenges I think software entrepreneurs in healthcare face now, um, with or without hardware attached to it, you know, but having to really kind of go through those adoption hurdles, I think that's what the art to me at the commercial side on the med tech of med tech was. Yeah. So that sort of what drew me to that side. Um, but then I just, because of, I guess, whatever generation, you know, I started in the early 2000s in healthcare and that's when like software was just entering. And of course, most of the stuff we were getting was from Israel or et cetera. And then you had to, you had to suffer through like living canal side in Amsterdam. Yeah, I mean, the so suffering, life. suffering. That's just, yeah, I really I'm was sure so many people. <laughs> yes, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it's been horrible, it's really, really been horrible. Yeah. So how how is the? I know Jim, you usually ask that question, but I'll. Uh, how how is the situation in in Amsterdam on opening up slash lockdown slash what's yeah. happening on the streets? Yeah. Yeah. Oh damn it! I broke my own our own rules here. <laughs> No, you didn't say it. I'm yeah, just it's not. I think oh, you're just warning me. Okay. See, I don't even know what I say half the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say I don't think I heard it. Yeah, no, it's good. I think we're I think things are up. I mean, we I guess June first, uh, the restaurants opened, of course, with social distancing measures. So a lot of it's outdoor patio style, which you know, we tend to love anyway. So that, that's all good. Um, I think there's a little bit more freedom of movement. Kids have been back to school for a couple of weeks now. I'm actually not quite sure about the university status, but of course, you know, younger children have. Um, most people are still working from home though. Um, I was talking to one of the entrepreneurs that I work with uh, and asked him, you know, is the company back in the office? And he said, yeah, most people actually still prefer to not come in. So I think people are still working from home quite happily. As you can see, I'm in a closet. So that's also an option. You can work in a closet. I'm in a, I'm in a garage. <laughs> We've really made it, Eugene, in our career. Like, uh, closet. closet in the garage. We've got some books in the background, or some look like some awards or something. Awards. <laughs> well, that you know, I mean, <laughs> wait, hold, hold, hold on. Um, you know, for the for the viewers, I'm gonna I'm gonna enter Jim's <laughs> living room. Nice. Right, there, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> I love the silver. <laughs> Polished, even impressive. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so things are good here though. We took a boat ride on the canal the other day. No oh, complaints. Right. Okay, boat ride. Right. I, I assume King's Day never happened, right? April 30th. Oh, no, no. Or 27th. I'm confused. Yeah, 27th. Yeah, it never that happened, right? No, I, I, like, I, I, have loads of questions. I have loads of questions. Actually, I asked you this question once before. I think I don't, you probably remember, but the um, I asked, and no, and the, the other entrepreneur, the other people on the show couldn't really answer it properly, which was if you were to pick European markets to innovate in, What's your what's your top what's your top three or three to five list of Scandin European and, Yeah, Scandinavian countries, uh, yeah. Netherlands. All Scandinavian countries, like I, like. Yeah, Norway, Sweden, um, Denmark. I'm not sure about Finland, but Norway, Sweden, Denmark, um, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. Boom. Okay. okay. Yeah, so that's part of my. I just gave away my secret sauce. That's part of my uh, go-to-market strategy for introducing technologies into Europe. Fastest path to not burn out your cash and actually get some good, strong feedback. The Dutch are great. I'll tell you, you know, you smell, your shirt is ugly, and your technology sucks. And then you're like, great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I know I can just go back and say I'm not going to do this. And that's what you want. You don't want the, that's interesting or 
come back a little later or you want like look this is gonna work or it's not gonna work and here's why that's the fastest way to not burn up burn your cash <laughs> on, on the market on the market entry uh i to be honest i don't follow it but the mdr regulation in uh in europe yeah maybe. but that's always delayed now okay so I was going to say, educa educate yeah. Jim and I. I don't know. I, Jim, you probably know better than I do, for sure. I mean. Jim's like, no, I don't really. I mean, come on. Do you think I really do regulatory work? <laughs> <laughs> it's got a team. I mean. I, Silver behind me here, Eugene. That's what you say. I got for the, sake, you think for the sake of Eugene. For the sake of Eugene, educate. Yeah, me. I mean, <laughs> and, and maybe some of the viewers can learn something from us, too. Like, 30-second MDR. <laughs> And you are expert, but yeah, no, what I understand in short, though, so I'm not going to educate you too much, but I do understand is that, you know, there was a large discussion around delaying the uh, start of MDR, particularly around the situation related to COVID, and that's now gone through, and so I think we're looking at delays into 2021. Okay. So that's given everybody a little bit of breathing room, but not much, to be honest. Okay, I, like, I have, like I have a bunch of questions, Eugene, I don't know if you're going to wind up, but I... Uh, oh, I, I mean, there. we're just shooting at... Uh... <laughs> no, yeah. But, so, so one of the so I, I think with you know we don't want to put anyone on the spot with the company they're working with who wants to be kind of have quite a safe space here but um but like big huge company right like like if you're so I, I talk about like uh, empathy for entrepreneurs like so so you've been doing this now for a long time right and you have like I I was I looked online there was something either you said or some article you were associated with that said J and J seeks like eighty percent market share in the markets they go into or some you know massive scale yeah. and then you're trying to innovate with you know early companies of whether they have any shot at that is just completely unknown and yeah. like how is like your like empathy for entrepreneurs over time as they have really small burgeoning ideas are you able to maintain it do you keep it in terms of how they could do a deal with a big huge company like yeah, I mean, um, well, I like to say I do my best. So I hope that some people listening to the podcast, whoever listens to you guys, I'm not sure, but <laughs> some people. Ouch. All right. I'm <laughs> dropping you off right now. <laughs> Just, no, no but I mean, I hope that some people will agree with that statement. I mean, I can't, you can't self, uh, you can't really review your own self, but um, I think it's LinkedIn. I think it's hard to keep up with the influx. Of requests. Um, so I kind of had to start to set aside time to like go through my entire LinkedIn inbox. And then a lot of times it's actually just connecting people to the right person within a you know, 132,000 employee organization that may have something of interest to do with that particular topic. Um, so that takes up time and effort. But if you're going to put you know, any kind of external innovation title to your name, I think it's a responsibility that you have. Um, yeah. and I know, you know it's really difficult to navigate, uh, companies like ours. So yeah, I'd say one of the things that, yeah, that I try to do is, is definitely do that is connect with entrepreneurs and help them find their way. We have lots of programs now that we didn't have like 10 years ago, right. whether it's J labs or right. things going on in quick fire challenges that are run, you know, to kind of promote connectivity to the external environment in the community and get J and J people out there. So I think we're yeah. doing that better than we we have in the past, but of course we still have a lot of gaps uh, that we could fill. Um, and ultimately, I think you know most of the time we have a certain model about like okay, we want to buy an asset in the pharmaceutical sector before it hits this phase of clinical trial. After that, you really don't make enough of a return. Uh, we might want to only actually acquire something on the med tech side, where we rarely do we acquire something pre revenue. Um, although right. we're trying to do better to kind of engage with companies because that was a model that was used when there was no software involved as well. And now right. you see a lot of, you know, combination devices where you don't have a device without a soft piece of software attached to it. So, or some interoperability. So then you have to think differently. Um, but it's also challenging people that have worked in corporates for a long period of time, even like myself, I mean, I'm like 18 years now to say, okay, you know, how do you kind of keep abreast and keep up with the pace of change in the time? And if you're not able to do that, you know, what do you do? Do you kick yourself to the curb or do you go try to figure out where is your best strength or, you know, how do you reallocate talent and people to serve the external market as, as it's changing as well? I think it's really, those are all. I'm actually curious, Ari, you, you mentioned earlier, you kind of, obviously, I mean, it's uh, what, when I, in my previous gig, uh, somebody told me on the first day, it's like, you know, if only, you know, 
Bayer knew what Bayer actually knows, right? There's so many individuals, there's so many projects going on, there's so many talented. And when you said you introduced people, I, I, did you, you know, qualitatively, quantitatively track kind of the yield? Because my comment when I did the introduction, I said, you know, try to be very straight up with the entrepreneur. Yes equals a yes, no is a no, maybe is a no. Just try to make those quick decisions. And I try to follow up actually. So I'm curious like on your experience in, in at J&J. &J. Yeah, no, I, I haven't, I can say I qualitatively tracked everything um, that I haven't done. But, um, but I also think, you know, for us, we have people that are like really deep experts in like the microbiome, for example. Right. So I basically, I don't, I give more sleep, I mean, more um, advice to the entrepreneurs on the outside saying, Hey, look, if you're going to work with a corporate, you know, make sure you have something really specific to find. And also it could not, it doesn't have to be piloting. It doesn't have to be commercial. You know, if you're getting this person on the phone, who's one of our world's experts in, you know, immune oncology, ask away because you know, that's, that's also extremely valuable. So we may not be in a position to do a deal with you right now, which is basically the answer most of the time. Um, but you're now getting, you know, access to somebody that could be a huge value to, you know, the way you're thinking about your business or the way you're thinking about growing your company or the way you think about the market or the science. Um, so I also think that that's a huge value add. If I can connect people to people who have spent, you know, years working on a space and have looked at a lot of companies in that area and can just give them some feedback. And then, I just, so I, I'm, I'm going to load them up here. So then I want to ask, um, so connecting uh, basketball, <laughs> so basketball <laughs> to uh, the digital health, to like digital health tools. Like, so how do, how do you apply your, your basketball skills? So, so for, the, for anyone listening, That's a rejection. the accomplished basketball player <laughs> compared to your career in innovation. Uh, yeah. How do you yeah, so, yeah, you got you to gotta use rejection, right? Uh, <laughs> Are you a lefty or a righty? I'm a righty. Okay. I'm gonna plug in. Actually, this is a really bad question. Okay, I was done. You guys are done. Um, yeah, I mean, basketball is fast paced. It's unpredictable, um, and it is a team sport, right? Um, and I think all those things obviously apply. Uh, you have to have confidence, uh, even when you've been denied. Uh, so like after your air ball, if you go walk off the court crying, like it's not going to bode well for you for the rest of the game. Cause you know, so in that sense, I think there are, there's a lot of punches thrown in this game. Um, even if they're not intended, uh, and they come from you at all angles when you're trying to kind of what you think, if you're trying to do the right thing and, uh, really build a reputation for being um, a company that's approachable from an innovation perspective, that's on the cutting edge of doing things and bringing internal people along, but inspiring people externally about where you guys are. Um, yeah, then I think you're gonna take hits from all sides. So in that sense, I think if you don't have your, a lot of uh, confidence and the ability to kind of roll with it and not take things personally, like, yeah. I don't think that digital health is where you are. <laughs> Jim, I, I was going to say, Jim, this is the first time I think ever that somebody compared or try to contrast basketball and digital health. So let's, let's kudos to you and, and, and Sarah's <laughs> background in basketball. Well, I'm going to tie one more thing in there. So I remember I'm trying to remember when I saw you last, but you mentioned something that you actually got your health coaching degree, which um, so tell us a little bit about that and actually how do you yeah. tie that in what well, you so with basketball and digital this is health. nothing to do yeah this is nothing to do with my company but uh i think you have to, i'm a learner so i constantly want to like learn something new do something new get another degree get another i mean i can i can learn forever so that's a good thing i think um but so what fascinates me now is the intersection of food ag and health um I think what we also see in most cases is if you talk to any healthcare investor, nobody actually wants to be, in very few cases, does anyone want to be a user of the product that they are investing in and or selling, right? Uh, so we'd also, we don't want to actually be on the surgical, you know, in the OR on the surgical table. We don't want to actually have to take medication ourselves, just like the fact that we develop. Um, you know, in, in rare instances where maybe you're doing something on like a vaccine, I think we all might line up for that, uh, although that's also debatable for people, I understand. 
um, you know, or an antibiotic if you need it for a certain situation, although that's debatable for many people as well, the use of antibiotics. So, I mean, in general, you don't actually want to be a user of healthcare products if you can help it. We all kind of want to just be these healthy people. But we know also that over time, it's almost like um, in some ways, like I think the human genome study proved that you're not as necessarily a slave to your genes anymore. So we all thought like, hey, if your father has heart disease, you know, and this person has this issue, you're, or breast cancer, you're like you're most likely to get it. But we do yeah. know as obviously there are some genetic predis predispositions, but we know your environment plays a huge role in how those things are activated or not. Um, and that I find really fascinating. And, and there, there's not many massive money-making opportunities for, let's say, you know, uh, bigger healthcare pharmaceutical-related companies in terms of the margins you would see on a therapeutic, like a drug. Um, but if we're going to kind of understand that space, to me, I feel like you, you have to get your, you have to be educated. So if I was to say, hey, we should really understand how to link up the health coaching community with primary care providers and have our company play a role in facilitating that, including how the health coach gets reimbursement and what opportunities there are for them to track their impact. Um, you know, the first person, the first question I would say to myself if I wasn't myself in that pitch is like, okay, well, what the hell do you know about health coaching? And now I can Sh say, like, shameless, oh. shameless plug. I don't know if you read our 40 something page health coaching report at your coach, but if not, I'll send it to you, including some yeah. reimbursement stuff. Yeah. Right. And so now I'm also reading a lot about the functional medicine space to really understand how that's taking a hold and uh, where there are people are starting to see traction there. And there, I think actually digital health and software is a great solution because the primary issue there is that, again, most of that stuff is going to be paid for people out of pocket. So it's not like you're going to have that um, done widespread at the moment. And in order to kind of show you how an impact, most of the people I talk to in these spaces are like, yeah, I can tell you I have like these testimonials, you know, from a physician I spoke to who said, like, this patient just came back and wow, what did you do, you know, while I wasn't around. Um, but it, but a test, and so a testimonial is great for, great for a website and it's great for building your reputation. But it's not great for building aggregate data to show a payer or some government institution the value that this, mm -hmm. this type of uh, person is playing, this stakeholder is playing in, in the role of population health. So I see a lot of opportunity there for digital health. Yeah, with, with, with in, all this, like, studying, in all this studying, what's like, like two quick questions, like what's shocked you, what's blown you away that's like completely blew your assumptions away about that whole area of you know, eating and looking after yourself from a health coaching perspective. What shocked you when you studied it? Um, so the similarities, I think, and so not necessarily in health coaching perspective, but as I really dive into food ag health, mm -hmm. I think the similarities in some of the verbiage and the thinking and, and the science in like when we talk about regenerative agriculture and regenerative medicine and how you're basically keeping the soil healthy. I mean, this is like basic fundamentals, right, of agriculture that we've completely ignored in the industrialized ag since probably under Nixon's administration in the US, I think is where it really started to go downhill. So let's say from that point in time until, you know, now what we've actually done to the soil, which has basically reduced the nutrient content of the food that we grow, which has reduced the amount of nutrient content that we absorb you know, and this kind of idea that, that everybody's supplementing themselves and all of it, you know, so it's created all these other um, uh, dysbiosis, I think people call it, right, in, uh, in the market. And then, uh, so regenerative ag and regenerative health, you know, you see some similar themes, actually, um, when you look at those areas. And then um, the other thing is, I remember a couple years back, being an American in Amsterdam, they have this group called the John Adams Institute. So plug for them, they do great stuff in bringing um, some really good speakers into Amsterdam primarily, a lot of them coming from the US. And they managed to get Joseph Stieglitz in town, who's uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist, um, and who I had read for years, especially when I was back in New York, living in New York. And he wrote a book called The Euro, so they were bringing him in to talk about that and actually to debate with the current Minister of Economics and Finance in the Netherlands about his book. And um, long story short, is to answer to the second part, the second aha was sitting with him at the table, I was having dinner with him right before his talk with a bunch of other people. 
And this Dutch economist asked him, hey, what do you think is like the biggest concern? Like, what do you see as the biggest concern for Europe? Um, and he said, which was completely off topic, he said, if you follow the uh, regulations on food like the US, that's my biggest concern for you. And so I was kind of blown away that this economist, there was, we were, nobody was talking about food. We were actually all having dinner, but nobody was talking about food. Um, and you can see it. I mean, it's, it's clearly evident if you've lived in Europe and you're, you know, you're eating bread and cheese, whatever you want to eat. Um, and it just doesn't do the same thing to you as, you know, what you're starting to see and sort of uh, the rates of obesity that are coming into the U.S. Yep. So there's something wrong, right, with the food that's contributing to massive health issues. And I do think that over time, companies, large companies like mine, have a bigger role to, could have a big role to play there. Food, food is medicine, right? I mean, uh, you know, Mark, Mark Hyman, uh, Dean Ornish, uh, just kind of following them. And, and it's funny, I mean, we've been here now, I guess, two months-ish. I, yeah. I, I feel like my diet just went to shit. Even though, yeah. like, you know, everybody upstairs is so healthy and we try to eat, like, uh, yeah, just totally. Like, is it because you're in the house? And, oh, because the U.S., U.S. versus I think U.S., yeah, just. Uh, <laughs> Tasty stuff. Yeah. Just U.S. Hard, there's no placebo on that one. That's a hard one to compare, yeah. Good point. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no, yeah, exactly. We get it again before he calls time on a stove. But, okay, favorite John Bon Jovi song, because you have a New Jersey Oh man, I do remember, you know, I used to go outside his house and you know the video cameras and me and my friends would sit out there and sing songs into the video cameras. <laughs> it says Sarah's Rumsfeld, New Jersey, right? You lived there. Yeah, Rumsfeld. Yeah, but Bruce was my favorite, I have to say. Yes. We heard some bad, we heard a few bad stories about, I mean, now John Bon Jovi's like uh, clearly doing great things for the communities and, and things like that, but when I was younger, I think he was more of like the partier and Bruce was like the guy who you saw on your way to the grocery store, who was playing with his kids they were in his both yard. They, you, they were both yeah, and they both lived like not so far from each other. Yeah. That's so you were a stalker. That's what you tried. Yeah, and you could go to Bruce's house on Halloween and trick or treat and get candy from him <laughs> in between his guards. That was also super cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And whatever John Bon Jovi's eating, the guy looks great, isn't he? Like he's like 60. He, looks, he must be eating pretty uh, good. But, but I mean, he spends a lot of time in Europe. Lots of people from Rumson still look good, you know, we age well. <laughs> you, you have like a Dutch, there's this part of you that's Dutch, right? Like, I just, yeah, just wanted yeah, to make Dutch sure. German. Yeah, background, yeah, yeah. So okay. unlike yeah. us, you, you, speak, you speak Dutch, right? Badly, but yes. Who had it? That's all yeah. I learned in five years. Who had it, yeah. <laughs> I'm learning a little That's bit good. of Irish. <laughs> a yeah. You're going to walk up to me and it. Who it? Yeah. Who it? So I'm, um, you know, if you've watched the previous one, I'm the timekeeper. I can do this for like another two hours easily. But. Yeah. But. Well, we have parties coming to an end. We didn't have any violations. We didn't have any violations. No one mentioned. I know. We didn't talk about the elephant in the room with the U.S. I, you know, I thought. It's funny, people were, we were debating that, whether we would talk about what's going on in the States. And like, I was kind of delighted not to talk about it. So I said, thank God we have Sarah on tonight. So we didn't have, so we can just shoot the shit and chill out. <laughs> she never <laughs> talked totally about anything cool. serious, so. <laughs> no, like loads of serious, loads of serious. <laughs> we always serious. Well, we, 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 t we touched on it uh, before you jumped on and we figured just, you know, enjoy our time with you, Sarah. Yeah, well, it's always enjoyable, gents. Really. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't have to actually be recording stuff. We can just do this randomly. And, no, uh, um, we so, should just do you know, this more to, to, to health and uh, well-being and to yeah. people just loving all people. <laughs> what is yeah. that? I'm not, I'm, not getting, I'm not getting paid by any sponsor, so I'm not going to put it in front of the camera. But it's a ginger, like sparkling ginger made with natural ingredients you know nice. that's a nice that's a marketing play when it says natural and and it's a it's a good way to end the episode food is medicine so watch what you eat and put Health in your mouth well, baby. Yeah. Food is is well. Well. Thank i'm you. gonna actually marina has a, a i think a hat that says health and wealth i'm gonna wear that next time yes you wear yeah i'm very yeah. confused about my diet so i need some I have to, what's <laughs> 
Sarah, thank you. Always a pleasure. And yeah, see you guys. Jim, till next time. <laughs>